Hello, I'm Belinda Goldsmith. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Thomson Reuters Foundation and I'm delighted to be moderating the first of a series of virtual sessions being held by the UN Women for Peace Association. Today I'm talking to Dr Robin Stern, who's the co-founder and associate director of the Yale Centre for Emotional Intelligence. She's a psychoanalyst, an educator, and also the author of The Gaslight Effect. We want to talk today about domestic violence. What has happened during the coronavirus pandemic? Almost every city and every country we're hearing reports about a surge in domestic violence during the lockdowns. Before the pandemic, an average of 20 people every minute in the United States experienced physical domestic violence. In various different cities in the States, we've now seen a double digit increase in reported domestic violence uh, um, during the last two months. Robin, I hope it's okay I call you Robin. How is the coronavirus impacting the levels of domestic abuse in the United States? Belinda, thank you for that question and thank you for hosting this series. And thank you to UN Women for Peace Association. Uh, I'll get to the answer to that question right after I read you this wonderful quote by Haruki Marukami, what I think is very appropriate for the question you asked and for this time uh, as we're struggling around the world with the pandemic. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. And I read that now because we're living at a time where stress and anxiety is greater than it's been previous to that. And the reason for that is that there are three factors that are contributing to the tremendous stress that couples are going through, that families are going through, individuals are going through, and it's changing all of us. The three factors are uncertainty, uncontrolled, uncontrollability, we can't control what, what's going on, we can't be certain, we can't be, we can't predict what's going on, and there's no timeline. So unpredictability, uncertainty, uncontrollability, and the ongoing open-ended timeline. That's a dangerous trio. And at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, we know that when you have this dangerous trio, your senses are heightened, you're on alert all the time. And so people who are living in, in homes with each other right now, in apartments with each other, under tremendous strain of not only the close quarters, but the grief and loss that comes up during this virus, during this pandemic and time of shelter in place, are suffering and tense and stressed and anxious is the word that keeps coming up as we interview people. People are more anxious than anything else right now. And so it's having an impact because couples who are on the edge with themselves are combustible. People are lashing out, people are dysregulated, people are not managing their emotions really well. We know that everyone right now is out of balance. Most people are spending 70 to 80% of their time in, with feeling emotions like anxiety and stress and worry and fear and terror even. Those feelings are high energy and very unpleasant and they're spending time there and also in sadness and loneliness and grief, very unpleasant feelings depleting you of your energy. So the combination of high stress and exhaustion, depletion from dealing with grief is causing people to not be able to manage their feelings. Never mind the fact that most of us don't have adequate training in how to manage our feelings when they come up. So Robin, how does this feed into the reports we're hearing about these far higher levels of domestic abuse and violence, not just in the United States, everywhere at the moment? Well, maybe yesterday, if you annoyed me, I would raise my voice. And maybe today, if you annoyed me, because I am tense and stressed and at my limit, I'm going to lash out 
Maybe I'm going to slap you. Maybe I'm going to scream at you. Maybe I'm going to terrorize you. So that's an example that people are not able to manage the emotions that yesterday, yesterday, meaning before the virus, people were able to better manage. When people are depleted of their resources, when they're not sleeping well, when they're not eating well, when they're not moving the way they need to be moving on a regular basis, when people are not able to have their own space, when they're in these confined too close quarters, they are irritated and impatient and that's the ground we're all living in. So as we're living on that ground, when things happen that used to be irritating, now they're infuriating. So it's all ratcheted up because we're living in this heightened state of anxiety where things are unpredictable, uncontrollable, and sustained over long periods of time. We're hearing, of course, that women are particularly vulnerable at this time if they are in some sort of abusive relationship or situation. What is your advice to someone who finds himself living under that kind of pressure, that kind of stress, where they realize perhaps things are getting out of control? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's very unfortunate and very prevalent. My advice to women or to anyone living under that kind of uh, power um, struggle and, and um, abusive situation or fear of abuse is to, one, Give yourself the permission to have all the feelings you have. You may, you may be confused, you may be scared, you may be grateful that you have a roof over your head all at the same time. You need to stay safe, it's number two. Probably one number one is to stay safe and give yourself the permission to feel and do whatever you have to do. Sometimes all you can do is take a deep breath and another and another to bring your own activation level down. Because we know that when we're activated, we don't make good decisions. When, when our emotions are in control of us, we're not able to think clearly. So giving yourself the permission to feel staying safe and bringing your level of activation down may be all you can do. And another wonderful strategy to think about what to do when you're in that situation is to remember what you would say to a friend have compassion for yourself in the same way that you would to a friend and give the advice of stay safe, do whatever you have to do. And if you suspect that somebody you know is in this situation, how can you help? I would reach out. Letting somebody know you care, letting somebody know that what they're going through may be just an exaggerated version of a difficult moment, but combustible now because of the circumstances people are living in and that it's okay. Let them know that you understand that they're really having a tough time and you're available. You're, you're gonna be there for them. And ask them if they need help finding some resources to help them in other ways. In your book, The Gaslight Effect, you look very much at this whole um, phenomena of people being subjected to this sort of psychological manipulation and abuse, often not recognizing as such. Could you explain a little bit about the gaslight effect? What is gaslighting? So gaslighting is a form of psychological abuse and it's a kind of manipulation that where the, the person who is doing the gaslighting, we call them the gaslighter, seeks to sow seeds of doubt in the reality, in the person who, and the reality of the person who he or she is gaslighting. And undermine their confidence, undermine their sense, their perception, and perhaps even their sense of themselves. And the effect of gaslighting over a period of time is very insidious and terrible. People begin to second guess everything. They can't make decisions. They think they're crazy. They think often they can't stop reaching out to friends because they don't know even what to say. They find themselves in a life where they don't know what's going on, but they know that there's something not, that's not right. Uh, they find themselves not able to talk about their relationship because they don't want to hear the feedback that it sounds difficult or terrible. When I, when I was interviewing people for my book, The Gaslight Effect, some of those women were running uh, battered women's shelters at the time and told me that destroying someone's reality and undermining their, the very foundation they stand on 
the way you see the world and what you know you feel about yourself is more destructive than hitting someone. But because the black and blue marks heal, but that assault on your psychological self takes a much longer time. And every moment of physical abuse is also a moment of psychological abuse. You work yes. quite... You work for quite a long time as a psychoanalyst dealing with various different clients. Where did people come from? Was it one particular group of society that you were seeing? Where did people come from who were being subjected to this kind of abuse? Belinda, they come from every walk of life. I've worked with women who um, were struggling to make ends meet and women, many women, who were w well healed and living on Park Avenue, Fifth Avenue, the Upper East Side of Manhattan, the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and all over the all, all over the country, during the time that um, when my book was first released in two thousand and seven, and then again in two thousand and sixteen, people would sometimes travel from across the country to live in New York while they were getting therapy for being gaslighted. It was such a revelation to, to some people to understand that they weren't in fact crazy that this thing that they were experiencing where they couldn't quite understand what was happening, but they knew that something bad was happening was suddenly revealed to them. So it was a question of, um, the gaslight effect was a, a helping people name something that they were living in order to be able to then unpack it and see if they could change the dynamic or get out. Because one thing we know is that gaslighters are not born gaslighters. Unlike in the movie uh, called Gaslight, where I, with the inspiration for the gaslight effect, in the movie, the protagonist, um, the male protagonist is trying to drive his wife crazy because he wants to steal her family jewels. And he does so by flickering the gaslight in the house. It's set in Old England, so hence the name Gaslight for the movie. And he does so by telling her that she's crazy and she's ill and then moving things around that she doesn't know where things are uh, that were once placed to the left. Now all of a sudden they're not there and they're gone. And, and he, he does begin to convince her with his persistence over time and her attachment to him in combination that she is going crazy. But unlike this diabolical guy, sometimes people just happen upon gaslighting as a technique to get power in the moment. As a technique to, we call it, writing themselves. People feel a little bit unstable in the moment. They feel like they're losing their, their power and they can write themselves by asserting their reality and asserting their reality. Sometimes it's very practical. It's the way your father or your mother got their way. And so you learned that. So it's so, the gaslighting is social learning. And that was something that, that was, more and more obvious from the um, the surprise about that was something more and more obvious as people wrote to me after my book was published and said, wow, I didn't realize it. So my husband's not a bad person. He just is doing something maybe he's not even aware of. Hmm. Well, we're thinking that we're starting to run out of time. If you just, to end up, if you could just say again, if people do find themselves during coronavirus lockdowns in a situation where it might be becoming violent, abusive, particularly for women, what is your advice to them? Give yourself the permission to feel whatever feelings you're having. They're all okay and important and they're information. Have compassion for yourself. Do whatever you need to do to stay safe. Take a deep breath if that's all you can do. Reach out to a friend if it's at all possible through texting. Reach out to Crisis Text Line. It's a um, in real time way for you to get immediate help or referral to help. And remember that you're okay. There's nothing wrong with you. Whatever you're feeling is okay. Thank you very much, Robin Stern. Thank you very much for your time today and for joining us for the first session for UN Women for Peace. Uh, we will be having other uh, guests coming on, so please join us for the next in our series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Belinda. Thank you, UN Women. Peace.